Good afternoon. Uh, so probably let me uh, introduce myself a little bit more, right? So that you understand where I'm coming from, why we are talking about this stuff. Um, so I have uh, initially have a PhD in robust optimization uh, from NUS. So it is talking about how to handle uncertainties in your optimization problem. Then after that, I continue my research in uh, Singapore MIT Alliance, uh, Texas A&M University, uh, Singapore Management University, to continue my research, but mostly on uh, optimization. <clears throat> Then in 2015, I joined uh, SAP. Anybody know SAP? OK, good. Uh, so uh, as a data scientist, so they have an uh, innovation center in Singapore. So I joined that uh, innovation center as a data scientist, uh, start to work on machine learning related projects, uh, start to develop machine learning products. And uh, uh, so that is where I heavily uh, use Python. And uh, in, in that company, I work closely with a lot of uh, developers. So probably a lot of uh, the participants in this conference are developers and uh, designers. Right? Then after that, I joined Visa uh, for about one year. Then I joined DBS as a data scientist. So I'm currently the lead data scientist for consumer banking group uh, in the Singapore team, right? So I'm supporting the uh, consumer in Singapore. So quick survey, who are uh, DBS customers? Okay, good. So the topic is relevant, right? Uh, so you know what is happening in DBS and how it can relate it to your daily life. Um, so since I'm a data scientist, I'm going to talk about um, things related to data science, to AI. And um, so mainly my topic is about how, uh, what's happening within DBS in this area. Right. So I will first talk about the AI, so-called AI industrialization in DBS. Um, then for the focusing area, sorry. So for this one, where are we are looking at? Then the most important part is the infrastructure, right? So, uh, so we, so DBS is quite, I would say, quite forward-looking. So in the area of AI, we visit a lot of different companies uh, in China and in other areas. So when we visit a company like Tencent, Ping An, uh, Huawei, they all talk about their infrastructure. They all talk about their cloud. They tr all try to monetize their cloud services. And um, so for example, Ping An even, they let you use their cloud services for free. And they even have a special program help to accelerate the progress, right? Help you to get into the Chinese market. So it is very important. So I'm going to talk about something about this in DBS. And uh, then the second one is related to Python. So in DBS, we do have a lot of uh, reusable Python code and the data set. So I'm going to talk about that uh, with the focusing on two. So one is uh, NLP asset harp. So uh, code and the data set related to NLP. Then the second one is AA reusable data set. So mainly focusing on analyzing how the user, uh, the browsing behavior, right? And uh, the last part is probably the most uh, interesting part. So I will talk about four use cases in DBS. So how we use, so what are the business problems, how we use machine learning to uh, tackle the problem to find the solutions. Okay? Okay, let's go. Um, so AI industrialization, so it's very high level. Uh, so currently DBS is, um, so DBS starting from, um, I think uh, at least two years ago, right? Which we try to make uh, the company a data-driven company, right? So to make that happen, so these are the things we want to do in terms of uh, uh, how we handle data, how we build, uh, how we use data, right? So the first one is data pipeline for analytics. So we want to make use of data easy for all the people. 
So, um, so since I've worked with uh, in quite a few companies, and I would say the banking industry is quite uh, conservative, right? The technology is very uh, not so advanced, and uh, always the last one to change. Um, it makes sense because it's not a the banks doesn't make money uh, by using technology, right? So. If you look at a lot of the banks, they have a lot of different systems. If you are a data analysis analyst, you, you, you need to have uh, access to a lot of different systems. You need to consolidate the data, then start to do some analysis. So I know even in some big comp, uh, banks in Singapore, they are still uh, using Excel to process data. So it's, uh, I can't imagine that. So the first thing we want to do is try to make the data uh, pipeline uh, easy for analysis. So the second one is um, resilience and the reliability. So we want to, uh, if we develop a model, we want to make the model, uh, so make it easy to, to train a model, to test a model, to deploy a model. So the third thing is reusable data sets. So I will talk about that later. Then automation of deployment, it is also very important. So once we develop a model, um, so I think if you wanna be a data-driven company, you need to use data frequently, right? So not most, uh, in most of the case, you wanna develop models. And then how do you make test, model testing easy? How do you make model development, development easy, right? So that is a very important topic. So in DBS, we, so, uh, we, we, do, we are building a new platform. So model development is uh, one part of it. So once you develop a model, if you're a data scientist, you're just adding a few code, then uh, you just run it, and it can uh, containerize your model, uh, make it uh, ready for uh, deployment, right? So the later you can deploy the model as an API or as a bad job, then uh, your model can be consumed uh, by downstream applications. And in the future, maybe even in real time, I got a model scoring. Um, so experiment, uh, the same thing, so we wanna make experiment easy. Uh, of course, the, another important topic about, about model is model governance, right? So once you uh, deploy a model, you wanna monitor the model performance. You wanna monitor the stability of the model input, the stability of the model output, uh, how uh, the model performs in terms of uh, business impact. So all of these uh, automate, will automate this whole process. So once your model is deployed, then everything is monitored automatically. And the last one is um, uh, make it easy to manage. Right? So sometimes we, uh, let's say the data scientist team develop a model, then we wanna hand it over to the product team and or to the team to handle the operation. So we want this, uh, this process to be smooth, to be easy. Okay, so that's the very high level introduction. And um, so in terms of uh, infrastructure, we are building a so-called uh, uh, ADA platform. Right? So previously we have different systems and we have different uh, uh, tools for uh, data analysis for uh, model development and deployment. So now everything will move into one platform. So it's called ADA. Um, so when I was in SAP, uh, SAP also trying to say, sell the same kind of solution, right? So the, uh, anybody know HANA? Good. <laughs> so HANA is a memory database, right? So when SAP talks about this, it says it's not a simple database. It's a platform. Right, so the data come into one place. On top of data, you build applications, you build a analysis, you deploy your models, deploy your applications. So ADA is quite similar. So, um, so first of all, it's just one place to gather the data, right? So maybe we focus on what ADA is not. So it is not a application. So it's a platform and it is not a just a data warehouse. So all the data go to ADA, and then on top of ADA, we do analysis, we uh, deploy models, we build the use cases. And um, 
it's not um, it includes Hadoop, but it's not a or Hadoop is uh, also have Spark, uh, uh, Kafka, so everything. It's not not only batch. So in the future, we will have a real time capability. When the data fl uh, fly in, we wanna we can do analysis in real time. We can do scoring in real time. Okay, it's also cloud ready. Okay, so that's the high level infrastructure. Uh, this is also very high level. I cannot talk about the details of the platform. So in general, the ADA, we have two clusters. So one is the uh, operational cluster. Right? So the operational cluster, uh, the, we have different data source. Right? So different applications like credit card, uh, like um, uh, saving account, uh, current account transactions. They're all coming from different systems. Right, so the data will come in, and uh, ADA will handle the data transact uh, inject uh, ingestion, then data storage, computation, and we can also visualize <coughs> reports on the operational cluster, and then do some analysis. So this is mainly for the production. Um, so for this platform, we use Spark, uh, Presto, at scale, Hadoop, and Alexio. Right, so you can see it's making use a lot of different things. So this part is most uh, relevant to data scientists, right? So this is our playground. Uh, it's called analytical cluster. So of course we are not going to do any experiment here. So any, we want to do analysis, we want to build a model, then we will export the data to analytical cluster. So the sandbox environment. So besides the production data, we also have uh, Maybe external data, you can bring in external data, uh, see how it can help you to do the analysis. Or sometimes the, um, so we have a partners, we have ecosystem. So if our partners is not on board the operational cluster, then we can get data, their data first, then uh, develop something here. Then once the data is ready and plug into a uh, operational cluster, then we can start to use the, the model already. So on the analytical cluster, this is the uh, Cloudera data science workbench. So it's from IBM, right? So this is where we use Python. So this, this is the Python environment. And of course, besides Python, we can also use R. It's also support R. But uh, I would say in uh, DBS, maybe 90% 90, 90 over 90% of the people, uh, business analyst, uh, data scientist, we are all using Python. So, um, so all the reusable data set is also developed uh, using Python. Right. So this is our playground. And um, for code checking, we use Bucket, uh, Bitbucket, to check our code. Uh, so this is the model. Uh, production environment, right? Once the model is ready, we uh, register the model, review the model, then deploy the model. So it's a uh, uh, in-production environment. Um, so besides these, we also use Click View for visualization. So so for now, we still have SAS for analysis, SuperSide and R. Uh, but of course, Python is the main tool. Okay. So that's our infrastructure. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about the our Python reusable Python code and the data assets. Uh, so at a high level, so we have these uh, seven categories. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, eight icon, but actually these two are very similar, the same. So the first one is uh, data science project code template. Right, so once we have a, a create a new uh, data science project, right, so the process is quite a, um, common, right? So you collect the data, you build the data pipeline, you do the variable analysis, you select the features, then you try different modeling techniques, then you fine tune the parameter, then validate the result, then deploy the model, right? So the whole process is quite, quite clear. So this is a framework to, to do that for that purpose. And these two are uh, uh, exploratory data analysis, right? So given the data set, I um, probably am a 
uh, from the business side, from the product side, I don't want to, I, I don't have too much knowledge, right? So I just want to simply understand the data set. So this is for that purpose. So for given the data set, it will describe uh, in this data set how many rows, how many columns for each columns, uh, how many missing values, uh, what the distribution look like, what are the percentiles, deciles, um, so on and so forth, all those things, <clears throat> right? So this is for the uh, EDA. Uh, data acquisition code, right? So as I mentioned, um, so maybe uh, for a little bit, uh, maybe one year or two year time, we still have a lot of different systems, right? So in, during that time, we need to still need to get data from different data source. So this is help us to build a data pipeline. So let's say today I read a, a data from um, uh, so from one server, right? Then I will save the the data into um, Amazon S3 bucket, right? So for for the data scientist, uh, S3 is the the storage. So we read data from the source, then save the data in S3. So tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing, but uh, I just uh, read the incrementals, read the delta and save in the same place, right? So this data will be shared and will be used by the same team, right? So for example, we have a, a centralized team called ACOE team, Analytics Center of Excellence. So there are about 20 people. So there maybe they are using the same data set. So this is for that purpose. So move the data, save into um, somewhere, then it can be shared uh, among uh, within the team. And uh, natural language processing asset hub. So I will talk about this later. Name analytics. So um, so in bank we also have uh, so for example your bank statement. So if you are an uh, institute, you will have a lot of different names, right? So sometimes the name can describe the same thing. Um, so this is for that purpose. So what are the names that are describing the same thing? And uh, also help us, so given a new text file, then probably I can identify uh, with a high confidence what are the names in the, in the file, even if it's the first time I see the data. So utility packages is more related to uh, maybe I, uh, how do I read data through uh, Alexu? How do I create a Spark session? So, so on and so forth, uh, very uh, low level functionality. So AA data reusable code, so I'll talk about it later. So I'll zoom into this natural language processing uh, reusable data set. So, um, <clears throat> so in the bank, uh, we do have a lot of uh, different uh, natural language processing use case, right? So for example, for consumer banking group, we have uh, uh, feedback from the customers. All right, so every time you finish a tr transaction, uh, maybe through Digibank on your mobile, then you are asked, you want to uh, read this uh, experience, right? Also give some comments. So, um, so this is one use case. So another use case is probably you need to monitoring your internal uh, emails, right? So, so the, the, the compliance team will audit that process. Uh, so they also monitor the emails, the images, uh, the contents in that emails. Um, so there are a lot of different use cases, um, but uh, all of these data are very specific to banking industry or to just DBS, right? So for for this for this kind of use case, we have to build our own um, code or data set. So for example, embedding, right? So you have different names. You have, uh, maybe you have uh, acronyms for your products, for certain companies, for a service, for a team. So all of these, you cannot use the uh, open source um, libraries to do the embedding, right? So you, to improve your performance, you need to have your own vocabulary. You need to do your own embedding, right? So in DBS, we consolidate all of the use cases and uh, create a common vocabulary, then 
uh, train our own embedding, right? So for this, so in the future, if you have a, a new NLP use case, maybe you can reuse the embedding. So you don't need to train the embedding again, right? Um, also, uh, there are other topics like uh, sentiment analysis, uh, language detection, so on and so forth. So these are common functions uh, we build into one data uh, code, right? So that is the NLP reusable data asset. So another one is the uh, AA reusable data asset, right? So uh, in the bank, I would say AA data is probably the, uh, in terms of volume, is the largest data, right? So each day, I may see um, this number of transactions, but probably for a single um, consumer, probably you just have uh, less than 20 transactions today, uh, a day, right? But in terms of uh, web browsing, mobile browsing, you may have generate thousands of uh, different records. So every time you land on one page, every time you click a button, then there's a new record in the system, right? Um, and um, this data is becoming more and more important because this helps us to understand the customer intent, right? So help us to serve the customer better. So this is the most important data set today. Um, so since the, the volume is huge, right? So probably we need to handle it correctly, right? So this reusable data set, so the first step is to uh, remove the duplicates, right? Then after remove the duplicates, uh, we use the cookie ID uh, combined with the, our internal data set to link it to a certain customer, right? So, um, so in this, after that, we know uh, these old actions are from one customer, right? But still is uh, uh, separated information. So based on that, we will create activity features. So for example, uh, which button you clicked, right? Which page? You, so you click through a uh, journey, then also can generate recency features. So this morning, what you uh, viewed, so this afternoon, what you viewed. And uh, we also create uh, page level features and uh, journey level features, right? So for example, if you try to do something, but uh, so this is a process, you always from page A go to page B, go to page C. So try this a few times, but you always fail at the uh, page C, or you will always drop off at page C. So probably something is wrong with the, that page, or you need some help, you, or you need some information. So we will have a journey level features, right? So all of these information help us to help understand the customer intent and what uh, cost the difficulty customer is facing, right? So we also know, so probably in one journey, <clears throat> where most of the customer drop off. So probably they don't need, they don't have the information or probably they don't want to provide some information. And uh, so in this journey, on which page you spend a lot of time. So probably that page is not well defined. So probably you need to improve your design, improve the uh, process. So this is very important. Um, so that's why we have this AA reusable data set. Any questions before I move on to the use case? No. Okay. Um, so in the rest of the session, I'm going to talk about four use cases. So business problems, then how we use machine learning to solve it. So the first one is called a hyper personalization. All right. So today we, um, so all the companies try to personalize things, right? So what you receive is different from others. So even today, if you go to Netflix, um, you search for the same movie. So two users may see different things, right? So the pictures, the descriptions are, may, can be different, right? So it's really uh, personalized. So uh, I think today a lot of people are talking about uh, N equals to one, right? So uh, every single customer receive uh, different things from others. So it's not, no longer a marketing based on segment, 
it's already marketing based on just one individual, right? So, um, so previously, when the bank do their business, it's product centric, right? So you can see, so probably these are all the products many, uh, provided by the bank, right? So credit card, mortgage loan, uh, deposit, investment. And in the bank, each product is still managed by different teams, right? So today, maybe this team, I, okay, I want I to have, I have some budget, I want to do a promotion, right? So I create an offer, so based on my understanding about the customer, then I probably build a model to help me to identify the leads, generate leads. Then based on the leads, I send this offer to the customer, right? So this is the old process. But what, what's the problem with this process? What I think you need, so probably is not the, what you want, right? So today I'm a credit card manager. I, I think you, so maybe it's true, compared with the other customers, your credit card take up propensity is high. So I reach out to you. But actually from your perspective, you may thinking about other things. You may need a mortgage loan or something else, right? So now we are shifting from product centric so everything is initialized by the product to customer centric. So, so to do that, the first step is to understand um, what the customer wants, right? So for example, uh, if you see a girl, right? So you have a crush on her. The first thing you want to do is you analyze her behavior. You want to know what she likes. You want to know uh, maybe Chinese food is favorite to her or Western food, right? So what movie she likes. What time you need to propose to have a dinner or watch a movie. So it's not a thinking from your perspective, or okay, I'm hungry, I want to eat dinner now. So I ask her, oh, do you like to uh, come with me to have a dinner, all right? So that's the old way. So you need to understand your customer first. So to do that is not, not a simple, I would say. So. Um, so a lot of companies, so when we talk about the hyper-personalization, we always refer to Netflix or Spotify. But if you think about it, they just offer one single product, actually. <clears throat> it's just a, the, the it's different product, but still same category, right? Just movie or just music. But if you think about a bank, actually bank offers quite a lot of different products. They are, can be totally irrelevant to each other, right? So it's much harder than uh, offering or recommend uh, recommending movies or music, right? So the first step is uh, we build a very <clears throat> big model, maybe uh, a few thousand output to predict the customer propensity of uh, product take up or uh, attrition or dominancy and uh, usage, right? Your usage of different products at the for example, credit card will at credit card level and uh, times the MCC. So today, my credit card usage on this merchant category, dining or travel. So at that level, so quite a few thousands of uh, output. So after that, I understand what customer wants most. Then I de decide um, the best channel to reach out to, to the customer, right? So sometimes you read email, you prefer read email, or uh, you prefer uh, SMS, or you prefer push notification, or you prefer human channels. And also it may depend on time of the day and offers, right? So for uh, probably uh, a $5 voucher at McDonald's, is, you, you, you don't care which channel it's from. But if you're talking about thousands um, of investment, probably you want to talk to a relationship manager, <clears throat> right? So based on the needs, we identify the channel. Then um, the next step is to, it's about the offer itself, right? So I say probably you need a mortgage loan, but uh, different people may have different um, sensitivity to the price, right? So we really want to personalize one offer according to your profile. So that's the offer and the pricing component. 
So the last one is uh, marketing collateral, the contents. So uh, maybe at different life stage, right? So for example, the, the example shown here, if you want a car, you want a car loan, but depending on your life stage, you may prefer different marketing collaterals, right? Respond differently to us, the same marketing collateral. So if you are, you are, have a family, probably you, you prefer a, uh, SUV, right? But uh, if you are single, you are fashion about cars, so probably you prefer more fancy pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So after all of this, we also want to decide what is the best time to, to talk about this, right? So sometimes, um, uh, so people say, uh, if you want to ask a girl out, probably you propose uh, at the end of the day or in the evening, right? So people tend to say no at the end of the e uh, at the end of the day, um, yeah. So, so this is the new process. We are switching from product centric to customer centric. So this is the first use case. Um, the second use case is customer bank relationship analysis. So now the uh, as a customer, you may have uh, quite a few different bank accounts, right? So, but which one is your main? Bank. So we want to understand whether um, our, the relationship between DBS and the customers is the relationship tight or not. Is it the primary relationship for the customer or not? Right. So today, if we look at a customer, so probably we interact with the customer through four different um, kind of channels or metrics. So the first one is product coding, and the second one is uh, balance. Inflow, uh, inflow and outflow, then interaction. So, so, um, so meaning transactions. How much I use your bank to do transactions, to interact with others, and payments. So, payments is another metric we consider. Then, based on all of these activities, we can have a score for each customer. But of course, your uh, engagement level will be different based on your life stage, based on your affordability, right? So if a people is much uh, younger than me, so probably um, he may not be interested in a mortgage loan. So maybe just some movie offers will be very good. But for uh, even the people at the same age, at the same life stage, but uh, their affordability are different, so probably they, the the engagement level also different, right? So based on the life stage and the affordability, we segment the customer. Then based on the each segment, we decide a threshold of the engagement level, right? So after that, we can build a model. Mm. So given a new customer, so probably I can classify them uh, in terms of uh, uh, engagement level, right? So how this is useful? So let's say if a customer is, so model tell me the customer is not uh, engaged, right? Compared with the, the peers, then I can identify what are the opportunities. So probably my product holding is low compared with my peers, or my I should have this level of transaction, but uh, I'm not. So probably I have transactions with other banks. So in that case, probably we can talk to the customer. So ask for the advices, right? How we can improve your experience, how we can further personalize the products so that we can provide services to the customer. So that's the second use case. So the third use case is community network. So nowadays, um, so how many people register do not call me or do not contact me? Mm. So, so what's the reason? So probably too much information, or you're talk all talking about the same thing. So every time you reach out to me, I, uh, you are trying to sell products, try to make a uh, profit, right? So nowadays people have this perception. Um, so, so what is important is community, right? So nowadays people 
probably don't trust about the direct information from the companies, from the service providers. So we have our own circle, we have our own communities. So I know where to find the information. I know where to talk, who I want to talk about to ask for opinion, right? So, so we want to understand how people interact with each other. So what are the communities they are in? And uh, so after identifying the community, so probably the next question is, um, who are the kind of high influencers in this community, right? So you know, for some games or products, when they initialize the launch, they don't sell the product to everybody, right? So they, uh, especially for kind of uh, electronic devices, so they, they just uh, sell to invited, uh, invite a few, maybe a few percent of the users. So these are the high influencers. They are eager to try different things, right? So after they try different things, they also compare. They also write blogs, right? They also make videos. So people, so these are the so kind of uh, risk seekers, right? So they try different things and they also influence others. Then probably the rest, 80% of the people, they are followers, right? So initially, no matter what products you launch, they don't try first. They just see others, what, what the other response. Then they make a decision, right? So we want to identify those high influencers. So how do we measure? It's still in test, right? So after I identify the communities, um, I know who, uh, how many people you are directly connected? And uh, are you a bridge between uh, communities, right? So are you connect, connected with uh, the uh, most important peoples, right? So all of these, we have different metrics to measure the uh, position of one people in one community. Uh, so probably this is still under test. So after doing testing, we know which metrics is more important. Right, so probably direct connection is most important, or if you are a bridge between communities, you are also important. Right, so through this um, use case, we can identify the communities, we can identify the high influencers. So in the future, probably we, if we launch a new product, maybe we invite the high influencers to experience the product first. So the last use case is uh, NLP use case, right? So as I mentioned, uh, in the bank, we have a lot of um, unstructured data, text data. So for example, you have a, a log from your call center. Uh, you have log from your branch, from your relationship manager. And uh, you also have five-star information, right? So from your mobile banking, from your um, uh, internet banking. You also have CSET and from other source, right? So we want to understand what the customer is talking about, right? So for, th for this specific project, uh, we label the input uh, as three categories. So the so complement, complaint, and the suggestions, right? So we build a model to classify the input into these three categories. Then after that, we have a, also have a, a topic modeling, a topic model to identify the topics. So for example, in uh, complaints, what are, they are talking about? Are they talking about the waiting time? Are they talking about the service level? Are they talking about the product uh, reliability or something like that? And then we can visualize that, right? See how many complaints, how many suggestions, then we zoom into the suggestion. Uh, what are they talking about? What they, they are suggesting? So we can even see uh, individual level uh, information. Okay, so that's the called the voice of customer project. Um, yeah, so that's all of my four use cases, uh, and it's also the end of my presentation. Any questions? Any questions for him? So I have a question regarding, regarding especially for the NLP project. So I know DBS operates in many countries, and uh, for example, Indonesia, they use the Bahasa. Mm. 
So in such a case, so how do you handle this kind of like language diversity? Yeah, mm. for example, like build or like a model where you know, it's like a difficult compared to free design English. Mm, so in the data science field, we have a regional BA, regional business analytic analysis team. So handling the collaboration between different markets, right? Different markets, I mean, Singapore, Indonesia, and China, Taiwan. Um, so, um, so we know each, what's happening in each market. So what solutions they are trying to build and uh, how they build a solution. And uh, once, so, so say in Singapore, one model is very successful. So we can replicate it in other markets. But of course, we need to retrain the model using the local market data. Yeah, so that's how, how it works. Mm. But uh, in terms of infrastructure in the future, everybody will uh, be using the same uh, platform. Okay. So, like, kind of process is like, uh, standardized. Mm. Like, uh, you can use like, uh, same infrastructure for any country. Mm, yes, it's one single platform, mm, but it's just for different markets. So, for example, in China, um, it's still kind of a well, same platform, but it's uh, in China, right? So, in, in China, the data cannot leave China. So, the server must be sitting in China, and uh, all the rest, if there is no regulatory uh, constraints, then we can put into one place. But of course, the still there's still governance. So let's say if I'm a BA in Singapore team, I cannot have access to data of other markets unless uh, I requ uh, raise a request so I can have access to certain market data for certain projects. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, yes. There's a question for the first use case on the hyper personalization for at the user level. I just mm. want to know User level data. Um, so all the data are within DBS. We don't share the data with others. So I think still okay, right? So so what do we mean by a privacy? So, so for uh, example, you guys go to the granularity where you know like the user, Eric opens his email at 8 p.m. Mm. Right? And to open an account with DBS, I also need to Eric needs to provide his IC, his mm. you know all like considered sensitive information. Mm. So I'm wondering. Oh. Such as he opens his email um, so it's uh, related to the data governance, right? So, so for certain people, we do. Uh, so that those people need to have access to those inform uh, sensitive information. But for the data scientists, if we just purely try to develop a model, then uh, they they are not allowed to have access to so-called PII, personal uh, identifiable information, right? So, like your name. Uh, IC address, email address, uh, phone number, uh, em uh, something like that. So that is not uh, uh, accessible to everybody. Yeah, but others. So even in in the bank, within the bank, we don't have. Uh, normally, we don't have the IC. So it's a party ID. So it's an internal ID. It's matched to the uh, IC. So normally, when we see a kind of customer, it's just a one-party ID and behaviors. We don't know who they are. Any more questions? Okay, no more. Thank you, Max and mm. Thank you. Uh, if you guys have any questions later on, you also can like look for him privately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.